Next up, we've got Give Me a Mechatronic Hand. So if you registered for this session and if you've received your Mechatronic Hand Kit, definitely grab that, keep that on hand. Even if you did not receive a Mechatronic Hand Kit, you can still attend the session. We're still gonna learn a lot and there's gonna be a fun activity to do um, for those of you who might not have the robot materials on hand. So, yep. Hi, everyone. So my name is Ravish, and today I'll be presenting on the Give Me a Mechatronic Hand uh, project. Glad to meet everyone here today. And so to give a quick overview of the session, we're planning for the introduction uh, slides and just to give you some uh, general background on the project and, and so on for about 15 minutes. And then we will break out into the activity session for 20 to 25 minutes. So for those of you who did receive a kit, you will join me in the breakout room for the debug and discussion section. For those of you who didn't get a kit, but are still interested in the session, we do have some virtual prototyping. So you will stay inside this main room. And then lastly, we'll have a wrap up on conclusion uh, portion of the presentation that will last between uh, 15 to 20 minutes. So now that we've got the logistics out of the way, I wanna maybe let's take a step back and let's maybe look at some sports. And so one of them is MLB. And so if you're looking at this GIF here, you can see that the, the center fielder is uh, completing a quite, uh, quite difficult catch. The ball is hit over his head. It looks like it's gonna be a home run. So he has to run backwards, um, time the ball, and then he uses the wall to help him to catch it. And so you can see that this requires quite a degree of both uh, dexterity, uh, athleticism, as well as uh, general uh, processing of information um, for him to be able to do this. And although, he's, although it looks simple, it, it's something that isn't, right? And um, even though he's helped by a glove, uh, you can think of the glove as an, as an extension of the human hand for him to complete this catch. So let's, let's switch uh, attention to a different sport, so NFL. So one of the famous wide receivers inside the NFL is uh, Odell Beckham Jr. And he's very famous for completing these tough one-handed catches. And so if we were to look uh, at him completing one of these catches, it's shown in the GIF here. And you can see he makes it look pretty easy, but again, it is a, is a pretty difficult problem that, he's, that, that he managed to make look very, very simple indeed. And so ESPN Sports Science actually did like a deep dive into some of the physics and the science um, for him to complete this catch. And so we'll go through a few snippets of that in the following slides. So in the first one, you can see that they've, they've broken it down to say that he only has 0 0.16 seconds to be able to catch this ball. So if he's outside of this uh, window of opportunity, most likely he won't be able to catch the ball. So it's a very, it's, it's, it's a small window of opportunity, meaning he has to be very precise um, with his motion um, to be able to catch the ball. Next, you see that there's a degree of planning involved because he actually has to leave the ground to, to be able to complete the catch. So not only does he require a lot of force to leave the ground, um, to follow up in some of the things that uh, Sebastian said with force equal to ME, um, but also that he has to leave, leave the ground um, ahead of time to be able to intercept the ball. And so this is only, he only has about uh, 0.4 seconds to be able to do this. And then lastly, he has to be able to complete the catch. And so he has to wrap his fingers around the ball incredibly quickly. And so you can see here that it, it's, it's eight milliseconds or 0 0.008 seconds that he has to be able to wrap his fingers around the ball. So the fingers have to move extremely quickly to complete this catch. And so he has to do all of these things while running, while moving, while doing it on the fly. So catching something is a, is a combination of a lot of different uh, aspects um, to be able to do that. So if you were to look at the components of the catch, um, just to break it down a little bit more, we can see that there's the anticipation set anticipation portion where he needs to predict where the ball will land. There is an adjustment portion where he needs to modify his body position based on uh, where the ball is. And then there's actually the grasping position where he secures the ball and completes the catch. And so later on in this session, when we look at the mechatronic hand, we'll mostly be focusing on the grasping, uh, grasping portion. And so we can ask ourselves, well, how is it possible that we're able to do something like this, such as catching a ball or playing a sport or even writing on a piece of paper? And so we know that it requires a combination of, of different aspects. So one of it is uh, the brain aspect, which is, which is providing the directions for the rest of the body, but there's also a biomechanics aspect as well. And so this combination of brain, which is neuro plus biomechanics gives us the field of neuromechanics. And so what are the components? Well, one of them is the eyes. The eyes are our primary sensor for perceiving the world around us. 
And so you can see here the tennis player, he's looking directly at the ball. And so from the eyes, we get spatial information about where the object is that we're, we're looking at. And it sends that information to the brain. And so the brain is responsible for processing this information from the eyes and determining what do I want to do next. And so in this case, it will want to move a muscle. So it sends that command down the spinal cord, which is composed of many neurons. And then it transmits the information from the spinal cord to the muscles via use of what's called efferent neurons. And so these efferent neurons take information from the spinal cord and transmits them to the muscles. So if you look at the muscles of the hand, I believe that Kieran probably went through this in a great amount of detail, so I won't touch on that here. As she probably mentioned to you that the hand is very dexterous. So these commands from the, that are transmitted from the brain via the spinal cord are sent to the muscles to actuate them as needed. And then the hand is also remarkable because it, it is able to sense information. So for instance, we know the hand can sense pressure, it can sense vibration, it can sense touch, it can sense temperature. And so it transmits this information using afferent neurons back to the spinal cord, which then transmits it to the brain. And so the brain is not only processing visual information, but it's also processing this touch information or this proprioceptive information from the hand. And so you can see that what's happening is something similar to like a closed loop system. The eyes are constantly judging information. It's sending commands to the hand, and then the hand is sending information back to the brain. Um, so this closed loop system is very important and something very often used in engineering. So following up on Sebastian's and Anais's uh, session, um, I think they did, did a really great job of linking how biology inspires robotics. Um, so you saw the example of the Kingfisher with the train, uh, which is quite remarkable that, that something as different as a train and a bird can still, can still have some kind of um, similarities. And so it's something similar here with robotics. Um, so you can see that there's the, on the left-hand side, there's a robot called uh, Asimo from the Honda uh, Corporation. And so it is composed of two legs and it walks similar to, it walks similar to humans, um, which are called bipedal, which were called bipeds because we walk on two legs. And so you can see in terms of form and structure that it uh, incorporates a lot of the similar features to like what humans have in terms of like joints. On the right hand side, there's a company known as Boston Dynamics that maybe you've heard about that uh, is, is growing in popularity because of uh, their very lifelike um, robots. And so one of them shown here is called Spot. And so Spot is a quadruped robot, meaning it walks on four legs. And it's similar in concept to what a dog would be or what a wolf or some other quadruped would be. And so we can see here, these are very direct examples of biology inspired robots. The question for us is, can you make a mechatronic hand that can catch a, fall, can catch a ball? So maybe we can't make something that is uh, as advanced as the human hand or that something that can achieve the capabilities that an athlete like uh, Odell Beckham Jr. can. Um, but the question is, can we do it with a limited, a limited example where a ball is falling? And if we can do that, how does it compare to a real human hand? So by going through this exercise, hopefully we can see some ways in which uh, biology inspires robotics and the ways in which there's still some differences that, that still require more research to be solved. Uh, this is the mechatronic hand here. So for those of you who've received kits, hopefully uh, you've seen something that looks like this um, and that you've been able to assemble it. And you can see here that on the left hand side, it shows most of the mechanical components. On the right hand side, it shows most of the electronic components. The point that I want to bring about here is that this was primarily 3D printed. Um, and so what I want to mention about 3D printing is that it's a very powerful technique for manufacturing and prototyping. And so that was used extensively in generating these different kits. So if you look at what are the mechanical components and what are their functions and how they fit together, we can look at this, what's called an exploded diagram of the assembly. Um, and so I'll start off with what I'll call fingers. So they're not quite as dexterous or as capable as our human fingers, but they serve somewhat similar purpose where they can grasp objects. And so these are shown here and they're connected together by these um, axles. And so these axles allow the fingers to rotate around them. And so we can think of these as being similar to joints. Next, we have what are called the helical gears. So the helical gears are what allow these uh, fingers to move. So this is connected to the motor and the motor is connected to this base called what I'll call the motor base. Um, and so this helical gear is interesting because uh, when it rotates, it causes all three fingers to rotate as well um, because it, it looks kind of like a helix. Beyond that, 
here's the IR sensor. So the IR sensor is one of the sensors that is used to capture information about the object or the ball. Um, it's not really a mechanical component, but I've included it here uh, just to show you how it stacks up. And then lastly, there's the IR sensor cover, um, which is used to secure the IR sensor to the base. And then finally, here's the stand in which everything rests. And if at any point you guys have any questions, um, please feel free to put it in the chat. We'll be more than happy to answer. Looking at the mechatronic hand in action here. Um, so here's a quick GIF of the prototype. Um, I don't know if it's playing. Okay, here it is playing. So you can see here that as the ball, that as the ball gets closer to the system, that the hand closes, but as the ball gets farther away, that the hand opens. And so that's the, one of the basic principles of the system is that it reacts to the position of the ball. And because there's that relationship between height and distance, as the ball falls, it's able to catch it. In some cases, depending on uh, whether you, you dropped it directly over it or depending on the size of the ball as well. And so if we look at the subsystems that enable the mechatronic hand to, to function, we can start off by looking at the ball. So as the ball drops, what happens? So we know that there's an IR sensor here. So what does the IR sensor do? Well, the IR sensor sends out a beam of uh, infrared light and it measures the time it takes for it to reflect. And so the higher something is above it, the longer it will take for that beam of light to, to be reflected. And based on this time measurement, it can make a, it can determine what the distance is to the falling ball. And so this information is sent to, a, to what's called a microcontroller. And so a microcontroller, um, you can think of it somewhat as like a computer chip in that it's doing a lot of calculations. But the additional uh, interesting thing about the microcontroller is that it has these different ports through which you can uh, interface with different sensors, whether it's an IR sensor or different kinds, of, uh, different kinds of sensors. And so the microcontroller takes that information from the IR sensor and determines how far do I need to open the fingers, right? And so it sends that command to the motor. So when the motor moves, the fingers also move. However, the challenge that we have is that we don't know the absolute position of the fingers, right? We don't know if the actual position of the fingers is what we commanded. Um, so we use another sensor called the encoder that feeds back the information um, from the encoder uh, to the microcontroller. And this gives the actual finger position. So similar to what we showed with the human system, there's also somewhat of a closed loop going on here where the IR sensor is constantly seeing information from the ball. And we have a motor encoder that acts somewhat like the proprioceptive uh, input from the, from the hand to be able to uh, determine where you are in space. And so I want to expand a bit about the principle of the height of the ball and the angle of the opening. If we look on the left-hand side here, we can see that when the ball is pretty far from the hand, the, the, the hand is open pretty wide. But as the ball gets closer, the hand comes, the angle between the fingers uh, gets smaller. So the hand comes closer together. The fingers come closer together. And eventually when the ball is just a few centimeters or, or a small distance above the IR sensor or above the hand, the hand is almost completely closed. And that is how it is able to catch the falling object because it uh, forms a relationship between the height of the ball and the angle between the fingers as it falls. Okay. And so before we exit into the different breakout rooms, what I want to ask you guys is this small activity. And so it's a high level comparison, combining the information that we got from the previous slides on the mechatronic hand and the human neuromechanical system. Um, so on the, in this column, we have different components of the human hand, which are the brain, the eyes, the muscles, the spinal cord, and the neurons. What's the equivalent mechatronic hand system for each of these? On the left, we have the different choices of motor, electrical wires, microcontroller, and IR sensor. So um, as we exit into our breakout rooms, we can think about, you guys can think about this and figure out which one is the best one. And then after we come back from the break, uh, we will determine whether your answers were right, right or not. So right now I am going to I am going to create a breakout room so that we can so that those who receive kits can join me in that breakout room. And then if you didn't receive a kit, courier will take you through a virtual prototyping session. Um, so let me set up this breakout room. Okay. Um, do you want to go ahead and share Huria? 
Sure, I guess that's most of the people are here right now. That's what it looks like. So I'm going to go join the debug session then. Okay, so let's go to uh, some electronics overviews that we use in Give Me Your Hands Mechatronics. Um, as you can see, we have uh, two Arduinos here, Arduino Uno and Arduino Nano Ebri. The one that we use for uh, making the um, mechatronics hand, we use uh, Arduino Nano Ebri because we ran out of space and uh, we use that one. They are similar in their uh, functionality though. And as you may know, every uh, microcontroller uh, works with input and output ports, output uh, the data sent from it and the input receive the information from this uh, sensor. So uh, as you uh, can see here, uh, we have IR sensor that uh, works with analog information. Uh, we consider it as an uh, analog sensor because it has a various range that can change, but digital is like one and zero, so it's a binary and work that way. For uh, controlling the motor, we use uh, a pulse with module signals, uh, which use uh, digital pins and then to fit to motor driver. And the reason that we use motor driver, I will tell you in this slide. So uh, you can see an H bridge here. The way that it works uh, is that um, if you close the switch number one and the switch number four, uh, it spins around uh, the direction that has been shown. And on the other hand, if you close the switch number three and switch number two, it spins around in another direction. Uh, so in the microcontroller, um, we have switches like this, but uh, it's similar to switches that you turn on and off the lights, but it's not mechanical switch, it's electrical switch, and it's much more faster. Um, the name of this kind of switch are transistors, and they, are, they work with a small amount of power, and they are more efficient, and a huge amount of current uh, can go through them. For the sensing section, uh, as uh, we discussed earlier, we had IR sensor, which is uh, which used um, analog output. And uh, IR sensor uh, is an analog sensor, as I said, because the height of the objects uh, varies um, continuously. And uh, the, how it works is that it's like a graph, uh, as you can see here in the vertical uh, axis, you can see approximately 1.6 volt correspond to a height of eight centimeter. I want to uh, give you an example for encoder here, which is digital as I mentioned earlier, and it has some uh, magnetic sensor in it, uh, works with Hall effect uh, sensors, and uh, it detects uh, where the magnet is uh, when it's closed. So uh, based on uh, which sensors goes first, as you can see here, you can uh, say that um, determine the position uh, based on how many pulses you have. Uh, and by reading of these uh, encoders, uh, you can say that uh, based on how many pulses in time, you can get the speed information. Um, so uh, if we want to make a circuit, uh, we, um, the, the easiest way is to using the breadboard. Um, as you can see, the yellow line, the, uh, the rows uh, are connected together and they can identify by number uh, as I show here. And every column have the letter. Uh, so uh, the, each columns are connected together and it's the easiest way because you don't need any soldering. And each individual cell, you can name it with a column letter and row numbers. So for example, H27 is point out to the cell that you can see here. Okay, uh, if you have any questions thus far, please let me know. I will be happy to answer. Uh, if not, uh, please join me with the virtual uh, breadboard and making our circuit similar to the circuit that we designed for the Give Me Mechatronics hand.
please go to tinkercad.com and hit the join the class button and then write your name uh, and then type this code that I wrote it here. I think you can see it in the chat box right now and then enter the class code so I can do it at the same time with you. So please join your class. and write down the code. Meanwhile, if you have any question or face any problem, please let me know. Uh, please enter your name here without any spacing. come to this page and then uh, in the left hand side you can see the circuit here please hit this and then create new circuit after you choose it so we are going to search our components here so um, you can go with me, um, whatever I write, and Alison will uh, write in the chat box as well. Uh, so I'm searching for the breadboard, small, um, as I discussed earlier. You actually have to just click it and then move your mouse to where you want to drop it. Yeah. Okay. After breadboard small, please type Arduino Uno. It pops up here, so you can have it here. And then please type down motor with encoder. As you can see here. Okay, so we have three components thus far, and we are going to add a nine volt battery. So I add nine volt battery. And then I'm going to add IR sensor. Uh, the another the component is IR sensor that we just pick from here and I add it here. And I'm going to add the edge bridge that we discussed earlier. Next. Um, I'm at polarized capacitor. And then I will add switch. So write down slide switch. Okay, so right now we have the component and let's connect them all. Um, so if you face any problem thus far, please let me know. If you're on the same page, I'm going to continue. So um, I'm going to place the motor driver in the center of my breadboard. I pick um, the row 10 for that. As you can see here, um, it's better if you put it um, in the place that I placed it so we can um, put this stuff together and when I name the cell uh, we do it together. Okay so um, 
right now we're going to use the battery and um, to power it so um, please connect the negative terminal to a30 so he's this one is the negative and I'm going to connect it. As you can see, you just need to click on the negative and then connect it to A30, like this. Um, please add the positive into A1 and drag it to here, then Select this switch and um, using the needle pin, which thing is common, and drag it to cell A3, like this. Terminal 1, drag it to B1, like this. And so we are going through uh, what we made in Mechatronics and here virtually with you. Hope you guys are with me on the same page. And um, we are going to power the motor driver right now. And so connect B3 to 8 pin. So it means A17 should be connected to B3. Um, next, let's power the Arduino, connect T3 to V in on Arduino. So uh, C3, V in your microcontroller. And the next will be Connecting the ground, so select line A13 here and connect it to B30. And we should connect the ground from our breadboard to microcontroller. So connect the ground to C30. And let's enable the motor driver. So connect five volt from Arduino to cell I10, John, sorry, J10. Okay, and connect D10 to G10. And E30 to F30. So we should go to encoder right now, as you can see here. So because we run out of time, I just read the extra positions for you and then I will show you what we you have at the end. So I connected before and just go through it quickly uh, for the rest of it and the connecting the so what remains is that um, covering the encoders so we should connect the fourth pin to ground and connect motor positive pin first to A15 and then negative pin to A12 so um, after connecting these guys and connecting um, the capacitance, you will see uh, something like I have right now. 
I will post it on Canvas so you can go through it uh, more carefully. Because I'm run out of time right now, I will uh, stop my sharing and then Ravish will go through the rest of the slides. And just to clarify, uh, the Tinkercad is a simulation of the um, mechanical hand or the mechatronic hand kits, correct? Yes, correct. So the circuit that you guys were assembling with the virtual prototyping uh, with the virtual breadboard um, is very similar to the circuit that was used to power the hand. And so I know probably you guys didn't have a chance to finish it, but the main idea was to get you some experience with using uh, breadboard because breadboarding is very useful for prototyping electronic circuits. Um, and so it's an opportunity to make as many mistakes as you need to before finalizing um, your circuit. So hopefully you guys got a chance to go through some of it. And like Huria said, we'll post the full instructions on Canvas. So if you want to continue with your circuit, you can at a later time. All right, and so now we're, we're, we're finished with the electronics overview. So hopefully you guys saw all of these different slides. Um, and so now uh, I wanna come back to the activity that we mentioned before we uh, separated into the different breakout rooms. And so that was a high level comparison between the components of the human hand, your mechanical system and the mechatronic hand. And so if you look at the brain, for instance, we know that the brain incorporates a lot of information um, from different sensory inputs. So for instance, it takes in information for touch, sense, smell, hearing, taste. And so it combines all of this information and makes a decision. And it's something similar to what the microcontroller does. So those would be the closest matches. The microcontroller takes information from the IR sensor and the, R and the motor encoder and decides what to do with that information. Um, the eyes are similar to the IR sensor in the sense that our eyes are pretty, pretty cool because we have two of them and we can use them to determine distance um, based on something um, similar to like a binoculars where information from, from one eye and information from the other eye, the brain combines them together to be able to determine what that distance information is. And the IR sensor uses a different principle, but it's also able to measure distance. So that is uh, the similarity there. Uh, muscles, uh, we know that the muscles are what moves the, moves the body around and in, and in the case of the hand, it moves the, the, the fingers. Um, so the motor is the most similar there because it, it actuates the helical gear which moves the motors for the mechatronic hand. And then lastly, the spinal cord and neurons, even though that is a very complex system in its own right, in the mechatronic hand, it's similar to the electrical wires because it transmits signals from the brain to the muscles in the case of the human hand. In the mechatronic hand, the electrical wires transmits information from the microcontroller to the sensor and the motor. Um, so those are some of the similarities there. Now, um, before we fully wrap this up, we'd like to look at position control. And so one of the things I mentioned previously is that key to the mechatronic hand is being able to relate position information of the hand to the height of the ball. And so how does it do this, right? Um, and so we can think of it in two cases. The first case is, let, let's say we did it in what's called open loop. That means that the microcontroller gets information of the height of the ball, calculates the angle that I need to be for the fingers, and it sends a command to the motor, and the motor moves. But does it move to the, to the commanded angle or not? That's a big question. And so in an open loop system, we can't really address that question. But in a closed loop, closed loop system, we can. And so in a closed loop system, what we're doing is that we're taking information from a sensor and using that to help us determine what is the command I need to send to my effector. And so for instance, here in the beginning it's doing something similar. The microcontroller gets, a decision, gets the information on the height of the ball and it, and it says, I need to move to some certain angle. What the, what, what's different here is that the actual angle, which is called the real angle, is subtracted from the target angle because we have the encoder information. And what that does is that it computes an error. And so this error term is what is uh, used to send the, send the command to the motor. And so in this way, by computing this error term, we can, actually we can actually move the motor in a very precise manner. And so in the next slide, I'm gonna go in a little bit more detail about what this error and target angle and all this other stuff is talking about. So one of the key principles of electrical motors, which is different from human fingers, is that 
the higher the voltage, the higher your speed. The lower your voltage, the lower your speed. So the voltage is proportional to speed. So let's look at the case of a large error, right? So this is the position we want to be at, right? But let's say we're pretty far apart, right? Um, so our error is large. Where we're actually at and where we want to be is very far apart. Um, so this is, a, this is what we would say is a large error. So what the microcontroller will do is that because the encoder senses this, it will, sense, it will send a larger voltage pulse to the motor, which will cause it to move faster. And so in this way, the larger you are from where you want to be, the quicker you will move so you can get to where you want to be uh, faster. Now, let's look at the case where the error is small. So this is where we want to be, but this is where we actually are. As you can see that we're now a little bit closer, and so the error is small. So we don't need to move as quickly because we don't need to get, we don't need to travel as far. Um, and so in this case, the voltage that's sent to the motor is a lot smaller um, because you don't need to travel as far. And so basically the idea is, is that the larger the error, the more voltage I need to send to correct myself. The smaller the error, the smaller the voltage is. And probably the closest analog that you might have is that if you consider like homework and tests and quizzes, right? A lot of times we look at those things as students as burdens, um, but what they help us to do is to provide feedback, just like an encoder does for the motor, right? Um, so let's say you didn't do good in your first homework assignment. Maybe that means you need to study harder um, or you need to practice a little bit more because you might've thought that you knew the material, but the tests reveal that there are some gaps in your knowledge. And so by doing homeworks and tests, it provides your, your teacher an opportunity to give you feedback. And so with that feedback, you can improve your performance. And it's the same thing here with the position control. It's improving performance based on feedback. And so I'm gonna use the last uh, probably 10 minutes or so just to quickly go through a couple of the differences between the mechatronic hand and the real human hand. So if we look in the sensors, right? We know we have two sensors for the mechatronic hand, the IR sensor and the position encoder. What about the real human hand? Well, in the hand alone, there are approximately 100,000 nerve endings and each fingertip has 3,000 nerve endings. So it's very, it's a dense collection of sensors. And you could see in this first image here that because of these, depending on the way the neurons are connected um, to the skin, um, we can sense distances between this object. And so what is shown here is what is called a uh, two-point discrimination test. And if you look on the right, um, the hand is designed such that there, there are multiple of these uh, sensory areas. So we can actually detect the senses as small as maybe three millimeters um, between the points of this divider here. And so because of all of these nerve endings, um, all of these sensors, we're able to do some pretty remarkable things such as, um, such as uh, distinguishing between different surfaces and different textures. And so that's a problem for that roboticists are still trying to solve as it relates to actual robots, because we're still finding it pretty difficult to uh, have the same amount of sensory information like the human body does and integrate that into something useful. So this is something that uh, a lot of researchers are looking at. The next one I want to mention is the number of actuators. Um, so we know in the motor, in the mechatronic hand that moving one finger allows all three fingers to move, right? And so that is because there's only one degree of freedom in the system. And so what do I mean by a degree of freedom? So we can do a quick test, right? So if you have your, let's say your right hand with your palm facing the table or the floor, and you try to bring your index finger down, that's called flexion. And you bring it up, it's called extension. And so that is one degree of freedom. Now, if you put your hand like this and you bring your index finger towards the middle finger, that's called uh, adduction. And if you bring it away from the middle finger, that's called abduction. And so that's a, another degree of freedom. So right there, we have two degrees of freedoms, flexion, adduction, right? And in total, if you were to do this experiment for all the joints in the fingers, you'd come up with between 22 to 27 degrees of freedom, depending on how you're counting it. So at the wrist, it's a very flexible joint. So we have six degrees of freedom. At the thumb, it's composed of a couple different joints. So we have in total five degrees of freedom. And at the different points along the hand, you have multiple degrees of freedom. So think about that, right? In the hand, we have 22 to 27 times more actuators than we do in the mechatronic hand. 
And so it was tough enough just trying to move one motor. Imagine if we had to move 22 or 27. And so scheduling all of these moves and determining where each motor or where each finger needs to go is a pretty difficult problem. And it's something that we do pretty easily. So a lot of researchers are looking at how does the human system do it and how can we apply it to very complex hands. Next up is speed of actuation. So if you look at the mechatronic hand, for those of you who did actually receive a kit, uh, one of the experiments that we did was trying to drop it from different heights. And we noticed that it seemed that the hand isn't quite quick enough to catch the ball. Um, and so here, if this is a video slowed down by a, to quarter speed, and we can see that it takes about 300 milliseconds to complete the catch. So it takes quite a, quite a bit of time to do it. In the human system, it's a little bit faster between 200 to 250 milliseconds reaction time. And you can see here that one way you can easily do that is by dropping a ruler, marking it off and catching it. And so this ruler is marked off in time. And you can see that this person caught it right between uh, 0.25 seconds to 0.3 seconds. So which corresponds to what we know of human reaction time. That said, um, I do want to say that there are uh, very complex robots out there, well, more complex robots out there that can achieve much greater speeds than the mechatronic hand that I've shown here and that we've assembled. And you can see how quickly this ball is traveling, but this system uh, is able to close very quickly on the ball. You can see that there's no rebound of the ball um, and it catches it in the fingertips, which if you look back in this one here, um, the mechatronic hand has to catch it on the rebound. So you can see that there's a difference in speed between the systems. But in general, one of the advantages of robotic systems is that it actually can potentially be faster than, than human hands. Um, so that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of research into uh, mechatronic and robotic systems because of their greater power um, to speed ratio. And now for one of probably combining all of these different aspects together, both the mechanical system, as well as the ability to integrate information. The biggest difference to me and to, to many researchers as well between uh, current robots and then, um, and then actual robotic systems is, is the fact that many robots that we've developed today aren't very adaptable. Um, so if you look at this here, this is an example of an industrial robot. Um, that's moving what appears to be a, uh, it looks to be a engine block and it's, and it's moving it from one place to another um, in an assembly line. And you can see that this is a task that, that an industrial robot is really well suited to because it's doing the same thing every time and it's very repetitive. If you, humans would struggle with this because the engine blocks would be heavy and doing the same action over and over um, is prone to errors for humans, but not so much for robots. So robots are really good in this limited situation. But if you ask this robot to maybe write a, write a note um, or, or, the, or to play the piano, it wouldn't be able to do that, right? Because it's limited in what it can do. It is designed for this one task and this one task only. And it's the same thing with the mechatronic hand. The mechatronic hand can catch a ball, but only certain sizes of balls. If you try to drop a bowling ball in it, it probably won't catch it. It can only catch that one specific ball when dropped from a certain height. So these are purpose built for a particular application. But let's look at humans, right? We can do so many great things with our hands. Like on this GIF on the left-hand side, we're looking at Alex Honnold, who is uh, renowned for doing his free soloing, which is climbing up these different mountains and, and, and cliff faces. And here he is doing it on El Capitan, which is uh, incredibly difficult to do, even with, uh, without the aid of, uh, with the aid of guides. And here he's using his hands in different positions to be able to maneuver himself. So this is a combination of both dexterity as well as strength, because it requires a great deal of strength to be able to hook yourself into these uh, different crevices in the, in the wall to be able to propel yourself upwards. But at the same time, with the same architecture, we're able to use this to do something very precision, which is uh, sketching someone on a subway, a moving subway, a moving train, right? And so Devon Rodriguez here is showing that he's sitting down on the train and he sketches somebody uh, using just a piece of pencil and a piece of paper. And it's pretty remarkable that with the same hand that we can do something that is so different, whether it's uh, using a lot of power to climb or whether it's doing something very precise, like using chopsticks or drawing. Um, so that just shows the kind of adaptability that we have. And so that is the next challenge for, for researchers and engineers is how can we make robots more adaptable um, to be able to mimic some of the capabilities that, that, that us humans have. And lastly, to conclude and wrap things up, 
Um, I just want to show a couple other uh, cool hands that use 3D printing um, or that use similar concepts to what we covered in the mechatronic hand today. Um, so there's a three finger gripper here that actually has a little bit more lifelike motion than the mechatronic hand that we, that we consider, but it's very similar um, in terms of what it uses. It also uses an electric motor. Um, so it's similar in that respect. And then we also have here the, the, the very fast hand that we were looking at, which is from the Ishikawa group. And so it doesn't use an IR sensor, but it does use some form of vision, right? So it does use some form of light. And you can see that it uses that to get the feedback to control where the hand needs to be, which is very similar to the motor encoder that we use to control where the fingers need to be. Um, so even though it's more complex, it's more advanced, it uses some of those same concepts. And then on the right-hand side here, there is a, a bionic hand from this company called Open Bionic with 3D prints of prosthetic arms. And so for people who have, uh, who have suffered um, amputations or been in accidents, um, they're providing these pretty cool and pretty capable hands that are 3D printed, um, but that have very, uh, that are very uh, capable um, and similar in some respects to the motions of human fingers. Um, so this is just some of the cool things that are out there. So if you're interested in this field, um, I definitely encourage you to look at some of these things, look at some of these videos online. Um, and, I, and I also further what Sebastian and Anais mentioned previously in terms of the different ways you can get involved into uh, different summer camps and uh, learning how to code. So those are very useful skills. Uh, and, you know, at the end here, I just want to emphasize to you guys that there's a, that robotics has come a long way and that we're able to do a lot of really cool things with it. But that doesn't mean that there's not so much more that we can go. Right. And so I hopefully that through this session and through other sessions, you can see that there is there's a lot of interesting things that we still haven't explored yet that are still waiting for you guys and future generations to explore. Um, so I really hope that message comes comes true. And um, lastly, I just want to give some acknowledgments here. And so I, I would like to thank Hurie for all her hard work in helping me plan the session, getting the kits uh, ready. Um, she did a lot of work there, so I really want to thank her. This wouldn't have been possible without her. And the same thing for the NBD organizers like Kathleen, Ashley, and Natalia. Um, they were instrumental in helping to helping me in many different facets to get this all together. Uh, Saul Schaefer, who's in, in myself at Ashley's lab, he provided a lot of help with 3D printing some of the parts. Um, TechSpark at CMU for helping to lend me a printer when my printer uh, stopped working. Um, the Borg Lab for their support. And then um, Allison for coming in on such short notice to help us out with uh, running the session and uh, helping you guys who didn't get a kit to be able to use uh, Tinkercad. Um, so I want to thank all these people here. Um, and so I guess we're running out of time, but if anyone has any last minute questions, please uh, go ahead and share.